Julianne's uh, 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 thoughts into a wider perspective. Uh, much of uh, this uh, Julian's presentation dealt with the tension between uh, sovereignty or territoriality of enforcement and universality of uh, enforcement. And uh, in a sense, this tension is ever present in international law at large, and specifically in international criminal law as one of the main uh, methods of its enforcement. Now, in a sense, and this relates to ex-territory, ex uh, this tension can be rephrased as one between a territorial concept of sovereignty and law, and between a uh, ex-territorial or universal perception of, uh, of international law as a uh, law that applies to humanity at large, without any requirement that there would be any territorial proximity between uh, the crime, the victim, the perpetrator, and a certain territory. Uh, of course, the, an extraterritorial perception of law is a precondition for the uh, essence of the idea of universal jurisdiction, um, as uh, Julian expounded it. Uh, now, this tension between sovereignty and territoriality is a product of opposing philosophical perceptions regarding the nature of international law, whether uh, uh, a set of binding norms deduced from state consent strictly, or rather a set of international norms deduced from international universal morality. Uh, now, in my really short talk, I, I want to contextualize this tension within the general process of development of international law, because it underlies much of the historical uh, process of development of this thing we call international law. Um, so where does it all begin, begin with? Uh, it is widely accepted that the notion of international law is traced uh, to the gradual weakening of the Holy Roman Empire um, with its dual leadership of emperor and pope. Now, it's a holy empire, there's a pope, so obviously the source of law is divine. Uh, so it's per se universal, right? Divine law is universal. And accordingly, uh, the emperor and pope exercised exterritorial universal jurisdiction over everything, over the entire earth, even things that were not under their effective territorial control. Now, if we look at the legal theory uh, that uh, uh, was prevalent at that time, it's one of natural law. Okay, if the emperor and the pope are the sources of, uh, uh, are acting upon divine law, this means that there is uh, natural law, universally binding, and it uh, derives either from uh, God or either from kind of a, a universal uh, rational reasoning of, of humanity. And of course, natural law is per se extraterritorial. Uh, this starts to change uh, after the Thirty Years' War, uh, which ends in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia. Uh, the Peace of Westphalia brought into being a new world order, a chaotic order of different states, without a centralized authority uh, 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 to, bind, uh, um, uh, to promulgate binding norms, um, such as the Emperor and the Pope. And the absence of universal central authority brought about the perception of the territorial sovereign state as the highest entity uh, in international law and in international order at large. Now, of course, the philosophical uh, essence of law at that time cannot be one of natural law, because who is going to tell us what the natural law is? We don't have the emperor and the pope to uh, control everything uh, in the entire uh, world. So the legal paradigm that develops is one of positivism, which means that there is no law which is uh, uh, natural or universal. Every binding legal norm is a source of a process, of a human process, in international law, a process of consent between states. Okay, so we take universal law, uh, we uh, dispose of it, and now we have law which is only uh, 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 a product of territorial sovereignty and consent. So, uh, this is the post Westphalian order. Uh, and for instance, uh, in this uh, uh, order of international law, sovereignty came to be defined uh, in absence of natural law as uh, strictly uh, territorial in the sense that uh, a state had authority to do whatever it wished within its territory. Nobody from the outside could uh, judge whatever it decides to do within its own territory because there is no natural universal law. Um, so international law was completely subjected to a territorial notion of sovereignty. Now, uh, and I'm speeding over very complex uh, uh, 
developments of uh, legal and philosophical thought, but I think uh, I'm going to touch upon the uh, really basic stuff. So this all starts to change in the 20th century, and here uh, Julian also uh, uh, mentions it. Uh, the positivistic, sovereignty, territorial perception of international law began to crack in the 20th century. And of course, uh, the First World War and the Second World War uh, made it clear that this uh, paradigm is not sufficient in itself to regulate the world order. And uh, the Second World War, uh, in particular, uh, made clear a few things. First, that the industrialization or mechanization of war uh, made the complete uh, perception of sovereignty or freedom to act in the international sphere, even by force, uh, something destructive, destructive which should be outlawed. That brought about the prohibition on the use of force in international relations. Um, another thing that uh, became clear is that the international community must work for a further collectivization and a multilateral approach to uh, solving international problems, which brought about uh, the establishment of universal, if you will, ex-territorial international organizations, first the League of Nations and then uh, uh, the United Nations. Uh, the third point that the 20th century made clear uh, is that the only way to confront or deter atrocities is by punishing individuals, even by uh, trying them in front of ex-territorial, if you will, uh, courts, Nuremberg, and, and then later on uh, courts in Rwanda, Yugoslavia, and of course the ICC, uh, the main uh, uh, international uh, tribunal nowadays. And significantly, significantly, I think this underlies the, the start of the shift from uh, uh, territorial sovereignty perception of the state to a more uh, universalist uh, uh, view of international relations, uh, the realization that states cannot be trusted to defend their own populations. And territorial sovereignty means that we actually give license to atrocities, and Nazi Germany is of course the uh, historical, the most famous or infamous historical example of a state that uh, used uh, its own sovereignty uh, to, in a completely illegal way, uh, domestically illegal way, to uh, commit atrocities. So from this uh, idea, the concept of universally binding international human rights emerged. And the idea of international human rights and international criminal law as one method of its enforcement is per se an ex-territorial or universal uh, idea which disconnects law from territory, from uh, uh, sovereignty, as a perception of, uh, of the ability to exercise force in a certain uh, territorial uh, environment. Uh, and of course, the concepts of uh, human rights also uh, relate to earlier <coughs> natural law, but uh, the reasoning in the 20th century is different. It's more about the uh, utility and uh, um, uh, what we want to achieve by enforcing human rights. It's not about because God uh, uh, wants human rights to be uh, enforced. Now, although this seems like a positive development, after the establishment of the UN uh, Charter and the beginning of uh, the international discourse of human rights, we are entering the era of the Cold War. Now, absent a universally binding enforcement mechanism in international relations, there is no international court to enforce international law in every instance. Uh, of course, the re recognition of universal norms opens a wide door for abuse. Uh, it can serve, serve as pretext for intervention, uh, for instance, and as is well known, during the Cold War, both the West and the East used uh, uh, the discourse of univers universal values to actually impose their will uh, on weaker parties, and um, the use of democracy, human rights, and socialism uh, uh, as universal ideas open, uh, was uh, abused on a wide scale. So, we see in the Cold War uh, high discourse of universal values, but on the other hand, abuse. And this uh, in turn spawned some return to territorial uh, perception of sovereignty as countries, uh, uh, colonialist, uh, colonized uh, peoples and, and uh, third world uh, countries uh, began to uh, develop a discourse of neo-colonialism. Uh, in its radical fringes, it opposed the idea of universal human rights at large, cultural relativism and so forth as a, some kind of an opposition to the uh, potential of abuse embodied in universal perceptions of human rights 
and other values. So in the uh, Cold War era, era, we have the grand concept of human rights on one hand, on the other hand, uh, vast or wide disagreement regarding how it is to be implemented and the mechanisms to do so. Now, uh, in 1990, we have, the, of course, the collapse of the Iron Curtain, uh, the end of the Cold War, and presumably this opened the door to a renewed consensus about uh, universal values and human rights, and we see in the 1990s a re-emergence of uh, the international human rights discourse as an organizing principle of the international system, and people, uh, you know, various commentators hail the uh, uh, triumph of liberal democracy in the 90s. And of course, if law is universal and human rights is universal, then, and, then boundaries make less sense, and this opens the door to world trade and uh, free trade, and we see the emergence of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and globalization, both in values and in trade, in commodities. And needless to say, nobody, not everyone in practice, enjoyed uh, the fruits of this new world order. Uh, the breakdown of the Soviet Union brought about a power gap uh, that uh, resulted in civil wars and mass atrocities in Africa and Yugoslavia and elsewhere. Uh, uh, globalization and free trade uh, uh, prompted a rush for uh, global resources, which uh, uh, of course uh, augmented this problem and was the reason be, uh, behind uh, uh, many of these uh, internal conflicts. And the international community, although we have these universal values, was not responding to uh, uh, these challenges uh, in a, a, a sufficient manner. So, again in the 1990s, we see a gap between the high discourse of universalism and human rights and the situation on the ground where these principles are not, in fact, implemented. And one of the main responses of international law, uh, effective or not effective, that's a different question, was uh, the development of further, uh, further development of international criminal law in the 1990s. Uh, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and of course the ICC is a product of uh, the way uh, of, of, of the need to reconcile between the high discourse of universal values and what we see in the ground. Uh, so, and, and of course, the enhanced uh, discussion of universal jurisdiction is also kind of a response to the frustration of the inability to reconcile reality with our, our uh, the international values. Uh, now, this is not the end of the story. Uh, the liberal democratic utopia you will, of the 1990s, at least in this course, uh, gradually transformed, and specifically after 9-11 and the global war of terror, to, to a fear uh, among what is now called the, uh, uh, the Global South, what was once called the Third World, the Global South of uh, unrestrained American uh, dominance and hegemony, uh, a dominance which uses hard military power on one hand, backed with soft if you will, power of uh, imperialism, norm imperialism, and value imperialism, and so forth. And this fear, uh, which brings us to where we are today, as I see it, again prompted some kind of return to uh, discourse of sovereignty and territoriality and rejection of uh, universalism. Um, and I think uh, this actually explains some of this balance that Julian uh, talked about between denationalization and territoriality, which is very strong in uh, current discourse. But as uh, Julian mentioned, I think uh, it's not an absolute return to sovereignty. There is an uh, understanding, even among the global south, if you want Africa, that uh, there is need for a, a universal or collective uh, uh, response to international problems, which must rest upon some notions of uh, universal values. But the means of implementing it are more and more uh, uh, withdrawn into territorial uh, uh, restraints. And I think this can explain what Julian mentioned in the context of uh, criminal law. It can also explain why the Global South tries to limit the discourse of human rights on one hand, but on the other hand they do argue for extraterritorial application of human rights when it comes to American actions abroad. So we see this uh, uh, tension. And last, and I think most importantly, since, the, since 
In the last decade, there has been an effort to redefine sovereignty within the UN, and sovereignty was defined in, 2000, in 2005 in a, a high-level meeting of world leaders uh, in the UN as the responsibility to protect populations from uh, very grave atrocities. Okay, so on the one hand, we have a, a, a definition of sovereignty in terms of protection of universal values, but when you look at what is uh, protected, you see only mass atrocities. There is no perception or adoption of an idea of sovereignty as democracy, or sovereignty as human rights, or sovereignty as equality, but sovereignty as a core uh, responsibility, responsibility to protect from very basic human rights. And this is even uh, for those who are familiar with the writings of Carl Schmidt. Carl Schmidt, this is kind of a perception of sovereign as a sovereign as a protector. This is also another uh, way to balance between universal universalism and uh, the perception of sovereignty. So in some, I think we can say we live in an era in which uh, territoriality was reinvoked as a response uh, to the abuse, perhaps or the perceived abuse, or the potential of abuse of uh, universal values. Uh, on another hand, there is an understanding that there is a need to confront uh, mass atrocities with universal norms. Uh, so there is a Compromise on the one hand, recognition of universal norms, on the other hand, kind of a compromise on how do we enforce them and how we define the scope of these norms. And I think this relates also to what you mentioned. So, try to be brief.